This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Since 1858, the ANS has supported research and education in numismatics and the history of money. With a collection of over 800,000 objects, an extensive library, a dynamic publishing arm, and ever-improving online research resources, we have become one of the largest numismatic institutions in the world. If you wish to support the ANS and the work we do, you can join as a member and become a part of this historic community. Go to numismatics.org membership to see options and prices. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is the coinage of the Confederation era, the state coinages. Uh, why did we need these? Uh, during our colonial times, we were always hard pressed in commerce for money. Uh, uh, the Navigation Acts, the Intolerable Acts, uh, there was a lot of legislation in England you know, holding us back uh, financially and, and economically. And the existence of the colonies was not for our benefit. The existence of the colonies was in rich England. And uh, in doing so, we ended up, at least we felt that we were being treated like second class citizens. Uh, and we did have a hard time in commerce getting money because England would not send over silver and gold in general because they operated on the theory of mercantilism. How wealthy a country is depends on how much money is in their physical borders. So they wanted silver and gold from us, but they wanted to send back product for us and no money. So it made commerce difficult, uh, which is why probably the most common seen coins in colonial times were from Spanish America, uh, gotten through trade. But we got so frustrated with this, I'm going to go to a PowerPoint. There, there it is. Now we have it. Okay, I've already been introduced and we've wasted enough time. Uh, so uh, the colonists had enough after everything happening up in Boston. Uh, so in July of 1776, uh, we have the, uh, the Congress met on July 4th, 1776, and uh, we had the Declaration of Independence, uh, where we recognized that we were no longer uh, part of the British Empire. And in doing so, we needed some laws to go by. So uh, we developed the Articles of Confederation. It's under the Articles of Confederation that we agreed that the states had the right to coin their own money. Uh, and that's what we operated under. Uh, it wasn't until 1783 and uh, the Treaty of Paris uh, where King George agreed, yes, indeed, uh, we were free from British rule. And we coined money in four of our states, former colonies, and that coinage right was taken away by uh, the Declaration of Independence. Now we're going to look at coins, and I'm going to try to go. Okay. So we had four colonies or four states uh, that decided to take advantage of this, and that was uh, Massachusetts. Uh, Vermont, Connecticut, and New Jersey. There were propositions in New York for a coinage, but the legislature decided just to value what was already in circulation. Uh, and I am going to start actually with Massachusetts. Put up a... Okay. Uh, Massachusetts had uh, legislation in October of 1786 to establish a mint. Uh, that legislation said that uh, they authorized 70,000 pounds in cents and half cents to be struck. Uh, by the time the mint closed, they only struck uh, about uh, 3,500 uh, and uh, $3,500 worth of that is in shillings and pence. And, uh, uh, it was one of those things where they took, after two years in operation, they took an inventory of, uh, of what the mint cost, the production of coins, and the value of what was minted, and found out that they lost a lot of money. It cost about twice as much to make a cent 
as the cent was worth. Uh, the, the coinage started in 1787 and ended in 1788. Uh, the coins uh, on the reverse have the date and an eagle with the denomination in a shield in the center of the eagle. This is the only state copper whose legends are in English uh, uh, rather than Latin. And the obverse has a Native American uh, commonwealth. Uh, he's holding a bow and an arrow, standing on a mound and looking at a star. Uh, there are approximately 50 different dye varieties of cents and half cents, if you combine the two together. Uh, the half cent looks pretty much the same. As the cent, just smaller. And the denomination, of course, on the shield says half cent. That's 1787. Okay, calendars uh, engraved the dies for the Massachusetts coinage uh, until I think that the, the government thought that he was charging too much for the dies, so they brought in Jacob Perkins in 1788. And Perkins. struck uh, the latter part of 1788. I'm going to get a comparison in here. Okay, I got to force focus that. And for some reason, there... There it goes. Okay, if you see on the right, take a look at the S's in the legend. On the right, the S's are wide open uh, on the top right and the bottom left. On the coin on the left, I can zoom in a little bit on that. The S's look like they were made out of eights almost, uh, where they're closed. It's the closed S's that uh, the dies were made by Jacob Perkins and the open S's by Calendar. So we have the two different denominations, two different dates of all the state coppers. They were probably, in my opinion, uh, the best quality made. And this was a state run mint. They did not subcontract this to other people to do it for the state. And it made it unique as such. Uh, uh, these coins were described by Dickinson in his numismatical manual in uh, the 1850s. Uh, Sylvester Crosby described these uh, in his work, Early American Coins, in 1875. Uh, the state coinages of New England uh, covered Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Vermont. And that was written in uh, 1920 about by Hillier Ryder. And, uh, and Henry Miller, and uh, and that book will be good. Uh, it was probably the reference to use until cat good catalogs came out in the future. Uh, but that's it. So if you have any questions about uh, Massachusetts coinage or the people involved, uh, you know, put it in the chat button, and we'll get to it later. Okay, that's Massachusetts. Uh, Now, keep in mind that all of my coins are not as high a quality as you're going to see at the A&S. And speaking about the a and uh, Jesse, uh, uh, Jesse Kraft, the, the new curator there, has been doing a wonderful job updating Mantis. And if you want to see some pretty state coppers, uh, he's gone through the state coppers right now and is working on some early American paper money. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's much easier to search now, and the information is out there as good as the database will allow. But uh, there were two different types of Vermont coppers. There was a landscape and a bust. Okay, the landscape on the left is a Rider 7, uh, and... 
you'll notice a, a lack of detail uh, in the cent bottom central part of the coin. This is actually a higher grade coin, but the die itself was buckling and giving way in the center, uh, uh, obliterating the design of that area. But this has a sun poking its face up over the hills and the mountains, and there are uh, trees on the mountains, the date at the very bottom with the plow above. And this one reads for Montensium Res Publica. And uh, on the opposite side is a starburst similar to the Nova Constellatios. There is an up and down on these based on where the eyebrow is on the eye. But the reverse says Quarta Decima Stella, uh, the 14th star. Uh, referencing their desire to become the 14th state. The bus design, I take another one. The bus design has a, uh, a familiar look as to King George III. Uh, the obverse has Vermont Octori, again, Latin legends. And on the reverse is a seated figure much like Britannia. Okay, let's focus in here. There it goes. Uh, much like Britannia with the legend Indy at Lib, Independence and Liberty, with a date below uh, 1788 in this case. These coins uh, were made in uh, Rupert, Vermont by Harmon Rubin. Uh, and uh, they're dated from 1785 to 1788. So there's a four year stretch there. Uh, the, in 1786, for some reason, they discontinued the beautiful design of the landscape and moved it to a bus design. There are situations where after Rupert Vermont, some striking of the Vermont coppers was done in New York City and also at a place called Machen's Mill in Newburgh, New York, uh, run by Thomas Machen. He was a, a Revolutionary War officer, and he ran a, a hardware manufactory uh, in Newburgh. And it appears as though he had an official contract. He wasn't technically uh, doing any uh, counterfeiting there with respect to the Vermont coppers. But occasionally a mistake would happen and a, a coin like this with a Vermont obverse would be given a British reverse. Now, they accidentally, I believe accidentally, used the British reverse, and it was a well-worn reverse, and they pumped out quite a few of these, and this would be a mule. It would be a counterfeit reverse with a, a legitimate Vermont obverse. This is a Rider 13, and this is... A nicer condition coin. It's slightly clipped. Uh, the color and the detail is pretty good, you know, for somebody on a budget. But you always have to grade these by the obverse. Uh, the reverse comes however it comes uh, because the die itself is very worn to begin with. Uh, these, uh, the, the books on these, again, early uh, Coins of America by Crosby. Uh, the State Coinages of New England, the a &S publication in 1920. Uh, I'm going to be going over some books at the end, uh, but there are several Vermont Copper books. The very first C4 publication was a Vermont Copper book by Tony Carlotta. And then recently, uh, Dave Bowers put out a book on Vermont Copper. It's excellent. And the Whitman Encyclopedia covers the whole gamut. So all the State Coinages and pretty much everything that's in the front section of the Red Book. How am I doing, honey? Okay. Okay. <laughs> as long as she thinks I'm doing okay. Uh, okay, what I'm going to talk about next will be uh, Connecticut Coppers. Let me move my notes forward. Okay, Connecticut coppers were struck between uh, 1785 and 1788, again, for four years, uh, date-wise anyway. How much longer they continued, 
we're not really sure, but they probably went past 1788 a little bit, as long as it's economical to do. Uh, in, uh, in October of 1785, Samuel Bishop, James Milhouse, Joseph Hopkins, and John Goodrich were granted permission, legislation was passed for them to strike uh, copper coins. These were supposed to be valued at 18 to the shilling, and uh, uh, the designs were selected by committee, and the percentage of uh, 5% was to be paid to the state treasury every six months. Uh, and the whole thinking behind these state coinages was that it would make the minters wealthy and it would add funds to the state. And uh, it didn't do a whole, well, it added funds to the state, but I don't think anybody got wealthy making state coppers. John Hull might have with the uh, silver coins of Boston back in uh, the 1600s. Uh, these were struck uh, initially in New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, uh, these were also, there's a couple that are suspected to have been struck in New York City by John Bailey. And uh, a lot of them, I think all of 1788s, uh, current thinking is first struck at Machen's Mill in New York. And uh, this particular one is my best one, uh, condition-wise. And uh, the obverse has a bust left, uh, reminiscent of British coins. Here's a British George the, the second half penny, And you can see the similarities in there. Uh, this is a regal halfpenny. It is not a counterfeit, even though they spelled the king's name wrong. They left out an R in the spelling. But this is a regal coin. Octori Connect on the obverse, and then the reverse. Actually, the reverse. On the reverse is a seated figure. India at Lib, Independence and Liberty, the date. Uh, on some of these, the pole that she is holding will have a liberty cap at the top of it, uh, symbolically. Uh, uh, th these are quite fascinating. Henry Miller, uh, in the 1920 book, uh, had given you all the legends and attributed dye varieties. Dye varieties are now known by Miller numbers. A lot of the initial work was done by Thomas Hall. And then uh, Miller took that work, I believe, after Hall had passed away and uh, finished it up and published it. Attributing Connecticut coppers, for me anyway, is a nightmare. A nightmare. Uh, my friends that collect these make fun of me. But uh, there are so many different legends. Uh, the words are basically the same on the obverse and reverse. But if you look at the, the punctuation, this one has sink foil, colon, sink foil, sink foil. Sink foil, it lib, and uh, that's it. And this is one type of reverse. Now, uh, th this is, I don't even remember. Okay, this is an R reverse, and it's number four that has this exact legend. So these are known. Uh, by dive rights that are given numbers, numerical uh, designations for the obverse, and uh, letters for the reverse. And then there's some, there are about 350 different dive varieties of Connecticut copper. Collecting these by dive variety is not for the faint of heart. Uh, and it's a collection you'll never complete. So if you're looking for completion, uh, it's not the series to collect. Uh, Let's see. Uh, a lot of these were overstruck by New Jersey coppers and by Machen's Mills uh, to put on a design that would make it more valuable. So if New Jersey coppers uh, were valued at 15 to the shilling and these were valued at 18 to the shilling and you damaged this with New Jersey dyes, you just increased uh, the value of the coin by three pence by striking it with New Jersey dyes. And in doing so, you might not think that three pence is a lot of money, but if you do it to hundreds of coins, that was a lot of money back then. Okay, I think that's about all I want to say on Connecticut coppers right now. 
And then we'll get into my favorites, New Jersey coppers, and we'll see a, a few more of those. One thing I might show is that a lot of the coppers will have fanciful names. And and it's based on the design. This one happens to be called the Hercules head for uh, the, the style of the headdress on it. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's basic look looks like a, a Greek god, kind of, as opposed to regular ones. And there are other fanciful names, too based on the different hand-cut dyes. But on to New Jersey's. This is my area, and, and I love collecting New Jersey's by dye variety. I've come close to hitting my economic brick wall. Uh, actually, I'm going to just show one first before I get into types. Okay, the typical New Jersey has uh, the legend Nova Caesarea, uh, which is Latin for New Jersey. A horse head and a plow below, and below the plow is the date. Uh, this particular coin has a number 18 obverse. If you look closely at it, there's a die break going from the nose down. And this is uh, giving this particular coin the nickname of the bridal variety. Now, I never grew up on a farm, but I think that a bridal goes up in this area of the nose back further. So I think it'd be more appropriate to be the runny nose variety. Uh, with over 100 years of these coins being studied, uh, a friend of mine in recent years, well, in recent history, let me get rid of that, discovered that if you look closely at the date, 1786, buried in the plowshare, you can see the top of it there, is a mispunched six. And this plowshare is engraved rather deeply into the die. They tried to obliterate uh, uh, the six that was mispunched and then keep the dye working. Dye steel was expensive, and to redo a dye because of that minor error was just not going to happen back in the day. They bring it back to size. And then on the reverse, this happens to be a wide shield, uh, letter M uh, for the dye variety, and it's stated E Pluribus Unum, the first time that uh, our national motto was actually used on uh, a coin. Uh, which begs to offer why such an obverse that's related to the New Jersey state seal is on our copper coin, while a federal type motto and design is on the reverse. And uh, there are some theories about that, but I'm not going to get into that now. Uh, this is just a general overview. But now uh, that's an 18M. If you look at these two coins, I'm going to reduce that a little further. Uh, this is the C reverse, and there are different colorations. These coins have seen, uh, you know, the ravages of time, and some fare better than others. And there are some out there that haven't seen any circulation at all, and they're really something to behold. But these actually were in people's pockets, and they circulated, and the people that used them wore three-corner hats and had buckles on their shoes. But both of these dies right here are uh, the reverse C, capital C, and it's called the pattern shield because it's uh, used with uh, some of the pattern coins that aren't New Jersey coppers. But if you flip it over, the one on the left has a Maris 6 obverse, uh, which is obvious because the ears on the whole first will call it the letter M. But the one on the right, is indeed one of those patterns in the Munich Columbia. And uh, why that's with the reverse C could have been a possibility that Matthias Ogden and, and his people uh, might have struck this coin as a prototype to try to get a federal contract. Uh, there's so many things to speculate about, and, and hopefully 
information will just pop up out of nowhere in this computerized world, and we'll get a lot of answers to questions we don't know. And not knowing everything is what makes it so much fun. There's uh, any one of you can go out there, spend a little time on on the computer, and make a great discovery and write an article for uh, the Journal of Early American Numismatics, Coin World, uh, C4 Newsletter, anywhere. And if I made a big discovery, I'd put on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. But uh, in any case, that's one of the pattern uh, coins, the Maris 3C. Uh, Dr. Maris in uh, the 1800s uh, printed a book and a plate, and he did a pretty thorough job for not having the internet and having to, to deal with, uh, I guess his best communication was probably telegraph. And uh, in his honor, uh, we still use his numbering system. Uh, these are called Maris die varieties, where numbers are given to the obverse and letters to the reverse. So that's the Maris 6C and 3C. Uh, there's a type. This is a Maris 12I. And I'm going to put that other coin back up again for comparison. You'll notice that this coin, uh, if you don't know the parts of the plow, this piece right here on the left is called a coulter. And this is one of the coulterless varieties. And this has no coulter. And we theorized the coulterless varieties were the earliest of the New Jersey coppers uh, that were struck, if not some of the earliest, if not the earliest. So this has no coulter and, and thus its name. This coin has a lot of dye bulging on the obverse in the center. And uh, it's still a, a, a nice coin for what it is. Uh, what dye bulging is, is when they heated up the steel uh, to make the dye, they would soften it, engrave it, do whatever they had to do. And then once they were done with all the engraving and punching, they would harden it. And if they hardened it too fast, the center stayed soft while the outside was hard, and that soft center would bulge like you see here. If they made it too hard, then the dye was brittle and would crack. Little pieces would come out, uh, forming cuds and, and cracks that you'll see in the coins. It was not a science, at least not here in our country. Uh, in Birmingham, England, and over there, they had a lot more experience making dyes. But this particular one is the only New Jersey copper that we know of that has a repunch date. I'm going to see how far I can get in here before it pixelates. Yeah, that's good enough. If you see on the first seven here, there's an eight under the date. So originally it would have been 1887, and they did correct it to 1787. And that's a Maris 35J. And that's, that's the J reverse. Uh, there's an undertype in here. Uh, I don't know what it is offhand. And uh, the J reverse is very obvious because the shield looks a little lopsided. Now, all the other... New Jersey's you saw had the head facing to the right. This one has it facing to the left. And the date on all these are always weak. It is 1788, the Nova Caesarea. But if you look at the detail to the head and the plow, the plow is a much more complicated plow. Uh, the head is much more detailed. The type of plow that's here is the same type of plow that's on the New Jersey state seal at the time uh, and still to this day, uh, the elaborate plow. And uh, it appears, I'm going to try to enlarge this a little bit again. It appears that in the plow, the plowshare is made out of a sword. And if this is indeed the case, it appears that whoever engraved the die uh, did go to Sunday school because there's some type of biblical reference about uh, after a war hammering your swords into plowshares. 
Uh, I don't, I can't quote each chapter and verse offhand. Uh, but uh, that, there are three types and three dive varieties of head left a 49F, a 50F, and a 51G. This is the 51G, and the reverse has the pronounced outline to shield. Okay. Uh, how are we doing time wise? Well, we're doing pretty good. Somebody got a dial tone there. Okay, this is a, a Maris 55M. And uh, uh, the plow handles have balls on the end. Uh, it's a uh, 1787 uh, thick. The, the plow is just thick and bulky. But what makes this variety unusual is the legend on the reverse, Pluribus, the final U in Pluribus is struck over an S. And this is the U over S variety. Uh, they, they saw the error and then they tried to correct it. And that, that's a Red Book variety. Uh, it's in demand. This is Ameris 56N. Uh, we call this the camel head. There are three camel head varieties, the 56N, 57N, 58N. All three of them share the same reverse, the N uh, reverse, lowercase n. And most of these are struck over other coins. Sometimes the host coin is obvious. Sometimes it's not. Uh, it's pretty obvious here that uh, Octori, and then under the plow beam, you can see the CO of Connect. This was struck over a Connecticut copper. And I can never remember Connecticut numbers, but the Connecticut person attributed that coin to be a Miller 30-X.1 uh, variety. But uh, it, it's fascinating. So it was economical for them to strike over a Connecticut copper and they would make money in doing so, rather than having to buy the raw the raw copper, melt it into sheets, roll it out to the right thickness, stamp it, uh, punch out uh, planchets, then soften the planchets, then strike the coins. They could buy these in bulk at a discount and just strike them. But this is a, they call this a camel head because of the nose. If you look at the front of the nose, it's big and round. And for some reason, the engraver of all three obverses had that big round snout to it, and thus the nickname, uh, the camel head. Okay, this one is Ameris 61P. Play with the light a little bit here. Uh, nothing special about the front. Uh, the plow is a normal plow, except uh, these are, uh, it's like skinny. The features of the plow are very skinny. This is a large planche coin. Uh, I should, uh, there were two types. Let me show the difference between a large planche and a small planche. Uh, pretty much uh, 29 millimeter and below were the small planches and above. Uh, 29 millimeters are the large planchets. And we associate the small planchets with being struck in Rahway, New Jersey, and the large planchets in Morristown. And the reason for the two mints is that the original legislation uh, called for uh, Thomas Goadsby, Albion Cox, and Walter Mould to have a coining operation in Rahway. There was a split between them, and uh, the state government allowed Walter Mould his one million shares of three million coppers uh, on his own. So he set up a mint in Morristown. Having a separate mint and a different screw press, he opted to have larger planchets, uh, larger in diameter, while uh, the mint in Rahway had the smaller planchets. But this coin uh, is famous not for its size, but on the back, 
Forbes was misspelled and they didn't correct it. Uh, it's missing the U, the final U. So this is known as the Forbes variety. This was important because uh, when the Mint building, a, a place called Solitude in Morristown, uh, was ripped down uh, for a housing community, unfortunately, some New Jersey coppers were found and they were all, they've all disappeared. But at the time it was written up that one of them had this misspelling. So for the longest period of time, we assumed because the spelling, misspelling was on large planchet that Morristown must have made the large planchets coins. Uh, and then I believe with the discovery of the WM, the 62 and a half R at New Jersey Copper, uh, they, they kind of reinforced that theory. Uh, the 62 and a half R has the initials WM under the horse. It's a unique variety. It uh, resides out in Long Island in a, a wonderful collection. And uh, I wish it were in mine, but uh, that's not meant to be. But being that it was large plant with Walter Mould's initials on it, I think that verifies that uh, the large plant coins were struck in Morristown with Walter Mould. Now, why Walter Mould split with uh, Goadsby and Cox and didn't continue in Rahway at one mint, we don't know for certain. But uh, in a gene a journal of early American numismatics article, it was proven that uh, Walter Mould was convicted of counterfeiting when he was in England. And that might have had something to do with it. Uh, it most likely did, but we don't know for certain because the legislation in the state did not specify why the split was happening. But that's, it's fun to theorize about these things, but you have to make sure to know the difference between a theory and fact and never confuse the two. In 1788, there was another major type of coinage. This has a very straight plow beam on it and a, a very recognizable horse head. Uh, and on the back, on the reverse, uh, about 7.30, you see a little figure right here. And we don't know exactly what that is, but in general, we call it a running fox. And this is a running fox variety. There are several of them. Uh, the seven, this is a 77 DD reverse, and this is the most common uh, of all the running fox varieties. Uh, that's something to look for. If you ever find a coin with the fox that's on the right side, try to get it. Don't try to bargain with the dealer and get a better price. Just get it regardless of what he asks for it. My wife is laughing. But she knows it's true. Okay. And the last coin I'm going to show today is this one. This is uh, Ameris 62Q, uh, Morristown Mint, large planchet. And I was talking a little earlier about that one coin that had WM uh, below the bust. I think that probably what happened was that coin uh, was shown as a prototype to the state legislature, and they did not like the idea that Walter, Mich uh, Walter Mould's initials was on the coin. And he had already made another guy that had those initials on it. And I'm going to enlarge this. Maybe a little more. Okay. I'm well, playing with the light a little bit. Uh, it's more obvious on the coin with uh, with a magnifying glass. But underneath these three leaves, you can see the edges of a W and an M. So there was a W and M on this coin originally, and he obliterated it with this design so as to not throw out the die. Uh, the die for the actual WM New Jersey copper has a major break in it, so it may have only struck that one coin. Uh, all we know is that the one coin does exist, but the 62Q in a higher grade 
you can see the remnants of a WM. A friend of mine, actually, uh, Roger Saboni, wrote up an excellent article on the hidden WM variety. Uh, I believe that was in the C4 newsletter some years ago. Okay, let me get back to normal. Okay. And this uh, also has a stain on it. I believe that this particular coin was a green plate coin in his encyclopedia. Uh, okay, I'm going to go back now to share screen to a PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, uh, with respect to reference materials, everybody should be aware of United States Coins, the official Red Book. Uh, it's amazing how much information is packed in just the, those few pages up in the front of the book. And it's worthwhile taking a look every once in a while. Uh, what is amazing is the Colonial and Early American Coins Encyclopedia, Whitman publication. It has all the dive varieties listed, I think, for every or almost every colonial coin uh, that's in the front of the Red Book, plus some. And I, I don't know that it's public knowledge or not, but at the moment, Whitman has the second edition of this book at the printer. So it, it should be coming out soon. Uh, I use this book a lot uh, because it's quick, it's handy, and uh, it's really something that should be on every bookshelf. You can bring it's lightweight. You can bring it to a convention, have your coins listed in there, uh, do a little last minute research on something that caught your eye. It's just a very handy book. Uh, for Massachusetts Coppers, uh, we have Mike Demling self-published an attribution guide, uh, which is excellent. I use one of those when I'm at home and uh, covers all the cents and half cents. Uh, excellent. So the Colonial Encyclopedia with the Massachusetts Coppers uh, will get you going if you wanted to start in this direction. A friend of mine, uh, Mike Packard, I believe, Somebody talked him into writing a book on Massachusetts coppers, and he is my expert go-to guy when I have a question, and I hope that's true when it comes to pass in the near future. Vermont, the very first book that uh, the uh, Colonial Coin Collectors Club published was Tony Carlotta's uh, book on Vermont coppers. It's excellent. It goes through, uh, has pictures of everything, uh, goes through some diagnostics diagnostics. It's a wonderful first book to have out there. Uh, we also have the Copper Coins of Vermont, a recently published book uh, by David Bowers. Uh, it's worth the price just for that wonderful, wonderfully written foreword that's in it. Uh, but, but excellent book, and it's modern, and it goes past Vermont Coppers uh, to other related coins. With respect to Vermont coppers, it always puzzled me why Ryder would so nicely designate dive varieties for Massachusetts coins with the numbered obverse and the lettered reverse. But for Vermont's, Ryder gave die attributions by just a number, one through, we have one through 39. In, seven, in 1976, uh, Ken Brissett wrote a paper in the studies on money in early America on Vermont coppers, and he reclassified them, uh, numbering the obverses and lettering the reverses. And in doing so, you can see the re relationships and people that uh, study these coins in depth uh, can see the relationships, look at the defects and dyes, uh, get die emission sequence, uh, learn all kinds, of, uh, but it, it's a wonderful book, and, and all the articles in this book uh, are excellent. It was edited by Eric Newman and, and Richard Doty. Uh, I, I don't know if the ANS still sells it or not, but it, it's on uh, the, in the numismatic market. You can find a numismatic bookseller, and I'm sure you can get it. There's an example of what uh, the top of one page, where you can see that obverse ten of a Vermont copper is uh, paired with a J and a K reverse, and the K reverse is paired with two other obverses. So you can put families together, and some people might uh, check the where 
of the K reverse and be able to determine which came first, the 10 or 11. Uh, just because the numbers are in order doesn't mean that's the emission they were struck in. But it's all kinds of fun. There's so many ways to have fun with uh, state coinages. Connecticut coppers. There's not a current book out on Connecticut coppers except for the Colonial Encyclopedia uh, that does list all the dive varieties. They're kind of small, but they're of a quality where you can enlarge them a little bit with the magnifying glass and, and see. Uh, you know, other, otherwise, if they had full-size images in there, the, the book would be the size of a Manhattan telephone book and probably cost hundreds of dollars. Uh, this is a, a sample page of uh, uh, a book that I'm hoping will be published in the next year or two on Connecticut coppers. My friend Randy Clark is working on this. And uh, if you don't remember that coin at the top there happens to be mine, which uh, I'm very pleased to see and hope it makes it to the final cut of the book. But uh, it's really going to be something. That this is something the Connecticut collectors have needed for a long time. And New Jersey Coppers, Mike Demling also self-published a attribution guide for New Jersey Coppers. These attribution guides uh, give you the information as far as rarity and how to determine uh, which uh, dye that you have. And they're quite useful. There's no history or general information about the coins, uh, but it's something that uh, it's easy to carry to a convention and use uh, if dealers have coins in their case that aren't attributed, you can attribute them quickly with these attribution guides. And then this, I can't say enough about this book. Uh, uh, the three authors are all good friends of mine. Uh, the New Jersey State Coppers was published, uh, co-published by the ANS and the Colonial Coin Collectors Club. This will be the standard reference on this topic for at least 100 years, maybe a couple hundred uh, now, that doesn't mean to say that there might not be a little something here or there new that comes up in research, but it would only require uh, a little addendum. Uh, there, there's nothing in here that I, I feel could be written any better or in any more detail. There's, uh, it's an awesome book. If you collect New Jersey State Coppers, or if you're thinking about it, you need the book. Even if you don't collect it, there's so much history in there. And a lot of it could be applied to the other state coppers also. Ah, questions. Okay. Uh, I made it through that part Oh, uh, a little longer than I thought. So I think at this point, Austin has been fielding questions, questions on that chat uh, group there. And he's going to find me with questions. Hopefully I have answers. If I don't have an answer, I'll make something up for you. Yeah, and there were a couple of questions that were answered in the chat already. So there was a question about how many varieties of Massachusetts coppers there were. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's about 50 of them uh, combining the, the cents and the half cents. And uh, then there was a question about worth. How much are the coppers um, worth and the range that that might include? Oh, well, that that's a time-related question. There's a coppers panic and, uh, you know, the... the uh, Say, for instance, the Connecticut copper was struck and it was supposed to circulate uh, at a value of 18 to the shilling. A few years later, it was 27 to the shilling. And a few years after that, uh, like into the uh, early 17, uh, 1789, 90 in that area, uh, it went up to 48 to the, or I should say down to 48 to the shilling. So with the the coppers panic at the time. Uh, all the state coppers were going down in value, including New Jersey, but not so much New Jersey because it was the only state where the coppers were uh, allowed payable in taxes. Uh, so it, it was given a, a form of legal tender. So it held its value a lot longer than the other coinages did. And then there's... Um, uh, about um, coin shows and when and where they take place. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, <laughs> as Diane just told, uh, they're not taking place anywhere now. <laughs> but uh, there are national shows uh, such as the A&A &A conventions 
Uh, we were supposed to have one in Pittsburgh in uh, August, but that's been canceled due to the times. Uh, there are the fun shows in uh, in Florida. I believe that's held twice a year, San Diego. So there, there are several big national shows. Then there are state shows. Uh, uh, Pan has a state show out in Monroeville near Pittsburgh once or twice a year. Uh, I believe that's canceled this year. The Garden State Numismatic Association has one annually in the spring. That was canceled. Uh, uh, but if you uh, look in the press or online, there are sites that will list coin shows that you can attend. The, the big one for Colonials would be the Whitman Expo in Baltimore, uh, normally held around November in the fall sometime. And the Colonial Coin Collectors Club uh, runs their convention in conjunction with that show. So there's a, a high presence of Colonial coins there. Um, and there, there, there are no other questions right now. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to, to put them in, in the chat. Um, there were a couple of other folks who put some resources. There was um, a link to studies on, on money in early America. Um, and I also included the, um, the link to uh, how to search in Mantis, the, the database of the ANS. Okay. Yeah, I found searching in Mantis a little confusing when I first got in there. But then after searching a little bit and seeing what to search on, I can now pretty easily find what I'm looking for. My only disappointment is that uh, Mantis is written basically for ancient coins. So the weights are in grams. There's no way to put grains in. And all the legislation for colonial and state coppers uh, was in grains. And I, I know in my mind what 150 grains looks like. I have no idea what two and a half grams looks like. It's, it's, uh, but other than that, uh, you could always use a, a little calculator to convert grams to grains if you need to know. But it's a very useful tool. Lots of nice pictures in there, uh, and uh, if you're doing research, it's a handy tool to have. Um, and so there, there was another question added. Uh, it's um, why are there some? Why do some early states mint coppers, but others don't? Do we have a reason for that? Oh well, uh, some states didn't see the need for it. They were okay with what was in the circulation at the time. They were making do. They didn't want to go through the bother. Uh, so uh, Massachusetts set up their own mint, figuring that they would uh, gain all the profits out of that mint instead of subcontracting and splitting profits. But they ended up getting all the losses of that mint. Connecticut, Vermont, and New Jersey all subcontracted their minting to individuals. And I don't think anybody became rich. Actually, in New Jersey, you can make a good soap opera, uh, soap opera out of it uh, with the number of times people were sued in court, sent to debtor's prison. Walter Moore fled in 1788 to Ohio with creditors fast on his heels. and uh, It was strange times. Oh, did I answer the question? I, I get, uh, yeah, no, I a, a lot of states didn't see the need to do it for whatever reason. All right, so there are no other questions in the chat, but if you have anything else you want to, to add or if anybody else has any other questions. Okay, I have uh, on this last page in the very bottom uh, is my email address. And if any of you are on there that don't know me and don't have my email address already, uh, feel free to copy it down, contact me anytime with questions uh, uh, about these topics or if you just want to talk about colonial coins. Uh, uh, I, I love to talk to hobby. That's how I have fun. And I can also, I'll also copy and paste and put your email address in the, in the chat. So it's easily copy and pasteable, um, for folks okay. to grab that there. Well, good. That's it for questions. I, uh, Ray, I've got one for you. I mean, you just yeah, went over four state coppers, but Gosh, between the Machins and the Nova Aborox and all the English coins that were over here, I mean, within colonials that were circulating around, that were round and brown, there are hundreds of colonials, right, to collect? Well, yeah, well, uh, 350 Connecticut varieties, 140, 150 New Jersey's is 500, 
uh, Vermont and Massachusetts is another uh, 90, 590 different dye varieties of state coppers. And then you do have the Nova mm -hmm. Borax, uh, which we believe was probably struck by uh, John Bailey in New York City as a prototype uh, to hopefully gain a New York contract. The Excelsior coppers are, oh, I, I love to look at those. I don't own any, uh, they're out of my range, but uh, they are a beautiful coin. And I believe that those were probably prototypes also uh, from New York. And New York just decided uh, we'll just use what's in circulation already and regulate that. Machen? Oh, yeah, Machen's coins. Uh, I don't hear too much, and I haven't read uh, much about counterfeit coppers being refused in commerce. Uh, I know that they weren't liked, but I think that they were accepted for the most part. Uh, Thomas Machen counter counterfeited New Jersey coppers. He struck legitimate Vermont coppers. Um, oh, uh, if I stop, sh oh, Diane's telling me to stop sharing so I can see people out there. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think a lot of his, if they didn't readily enter circulation and become accepted, it wouldn't have been a profitable business for him. But, you know, at least 40 Machen varieties, something like that, you know? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's quite profitable. <laughs> I, I think I have about six. Nothing rare, uh, but uh, they're <coughs> definitely significant. And, and everybody collecting type colonials should have at least one that was struck by Machen's mill. So a ton circulating around the Confederation besides the states. Well, actually, the circulation of well, uh, state coppers uh, in the Coin Collector's Journal of 1876, uh, there's an article in there that states that at that time in New York City, collectors got their start collecting by pulling a New Jersey copper out of circulation. So even years after the large cents uh, were gone and the state coppers from circulation, People were still spending them. I guess they had them in drawers and just figured, well, let me spend it. So uh, I don't know how long or when the last one uh, actually traded hands in commerce, but I know that they were still around in 1876. Nice. Any other questions? Well, our friend Chris uh, is out there from Virginia Beach. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing good. Good. I did have a question. Sure. I was wondering if there was going to be a convention anywhere near here soon? Well, there are conventions held in the Virginia Beach area. Um, uh, but probably not in the near future. I doubt if there's any before the end of the year. Uh, but I will try to keep that in mind and make you aware of any that's uh, in the area. I have friends in that area that go to conventions. I know that the state organization in Virginia holds at least an annual convention there within driving distance of you. Okay, thank you. Sure. Well, if that's it, uh, I think Austin, being an employee of the ANS, is probably getting double or triple time. So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to uh, drive the ANS broke, uh, but it was fun. And thank you all for coming out today. Uh, I love talking about these things. And uh, uh, and if if uh, this is edited, uh, have the editor put in a little darker hair and a few less wrinkles for me for future views. I'll, I'll see what Alan, Alan can do. Okay, Alan's a magician. He can do anything. Okay, thank you, everybody. Nice job, Ray. Very good. Thank you, Ray. Take care. Have fun. And just to quickly advertise for everyone who is here, um, the Money Talks is a, a monthly or twice monthly lecture series that the ANS hosts. And the next one that we have is with David Hill, the librarian and archivist of the ANS. And he's going to be giving a talk called From Acorn to Sapling, the American Numismatic Society. <laughs>
Huntington, and that'll be at 1 p.m. on August 1st. So stay tuned from email, for emails from Emma on that. Good. Excellent. Thanks, Austin.